by now you should be getting the idea that it was a very dangerous business. That it was a very precarious bloodline to be a male descendant of David in those days. They're all being bumped off. And then, coming closer to our text this morning, slaughter number four, which is in the bottom middle of the page. Slaughter four was perpetrated by <coughs> Queen Athaliah. Now, there were very few lawful male claimants to the throne left. She realizes that if she can kill Ahaziah's sons, then she will be queen. There will be no male Davidic descendants left, and the throne will be hers. Now I don't want you to worry if all these names are unfamiliar to you, or if you think it went a bit too fast because it can be readily simplified and reduced to the essentials. And here are the essentials. There were four mass slaughters of the males in the line of David, whittling all the males in that dynasty down to one. Joash. In his generation, in the generation before him, and the generation above that, they're all dead. Just himself left. If he'd have been killed, therefore, no male Davidic son would have survived. And we'll see the importance of this later. This is unique. For the details of the four slaughters, you have that genealogy or family tree with the annotations in the back of the bulletin. And the catechumens in the congregation have had lessons of this material, so they are off to a distinct advantages. <coughs> three of the classes this year. Two beginners Old Testament history and the seniors Old Testament history dealt with this. So hopefully children will have someone come back to them. <clears throat> Coming to what's easier for us, applications and lessons of all this, what are we to learn from these four slaughters and from the well-nigh extinction of the house of <clears throat> David? The first thing we are to learn is the folly of Jehoshaphat and of false ecumenism in general. And some of you here will remember a series of seven or eight sermons on Jehoshaphat, the ecumenical king. He was king of Judah and he sinfully fraternized with the ungodly kings of Israel in the north. Jehoshaphat was a naive man. He thought that the kings of Israel who worshipped Baal and, the, and or the golden calves were actually secretly deep down believers in Jehovah. That they were good men and with some trust and care and thoughtful cultivation of friendships with them he could make them turn round more fully and do better with the Lord. So Jehoshaphat engaged in sinful ecumenical relations with the northern kingdom in war, in shipping and in trade, and in marriage. With Jehoshaphat's blessing, his son, Jehoram, married Ahab's daughter, Athaliah. And there's almost certainly Athaliah's, Ahab's daughter through Jezebel. And you all know who Jezebel was. And you can see how Jehoshaphat would have rationalized this. Athaliah, my new daughter-in-law, basically she's a good girl. She'll shape up fine. 
she will come around more and more to the worship of Jehovah. Especially since, marrying Jehoram, she will now be living in Jerusalem, and I will be there as her father-in-law to look after her and to direct her in the ways of the Lord. But he's an idiot. As long as Jehoshaphat lives, there's no obvious, blatant, evil effects on the kingdom of Judah from Athaliah's marrying the king's son. Everything seems to be going okay. But as soon as Jehoshaphat dies, and doubtless under the influence of wicked Athaliah, slaughter number one takes place. Athaliah's husband, Jehoram, kills all his younger brothers. Just as Athaliah's mother, Jezebel, had gotten her husband, the king of Israel, to kill many in that realm. Slaughters number two and three by the Philistines and Arabians and by Jehu would follow. Athaliah herself commands slaughter number four. And the house of David comes within a hair's breadth of extinction. And Jehoshaphat, in his naivety, never dreamt of this. And if someone would have gone to him and warned him of his false ecumenism and its sin, as they did, and if someone had gone to him and said, Jehoshaphat, your actions have consequences. Consequences not only in your lifetime, but after you die. And you're marrying, the you're marrying your son to the daughter of Ahab and Jezebel, will probably devastate the kingdom when you're dead and buried. Jehoshaphat would have said, Oh, no, 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 no. This is a good way to promote unity. This will protect our kingdom. If we're friendly with the northern kingdom and the church becomes larger and we amalgamate, everything will go well. And you're far too suspicious and you're tracing out far too many consequences. That's not how it works. But he was dead wrong. Because his false ecumenism almost spelled the end of the church. Not just in corrupting the church of Judah, but almost the end of the Davidic line through which Christ would come. And today's false ecumenists, and they are legion, if they are true believers like Jehoshaphat and most of them are not, but they're wicked unbelievers. But even if there be some believers caught up in the midst of it, the very best that could be said about them is that they are foolish and naive. They are foolish and naive. They think there is some good in these Roman Catholics, pagan religions. Other liberal Protestant denominations, there's some good in them. They believe, you see, in common grace, there's some good in everybody, because nobody's totally depraved, because common grace restrains it all. And we need to unite with these other Christian groups, or even Judeo-Christian groups, or even Abrahamic religious groups, or even religion in general. Because... This will help us win the culture wars and keep back secularism. Because if the church becomes bigger institutionally, this external unity will be used to convert other people. At best, folly and naivete. Because scripture says, What fellowship hath light with darkness? And what fellowship does Christ have with Belial, and righteousness with unrighteousness, be not deceived. 